Hey guys, Coach Alex from Fast Fitness Tips. Today we're going to talk about muscle fiber science. Now, why are we choosing that as a topic for today? Well, we've had a few queries recently. Here's one from Andy Knox, Toronto. He said, I've got a dilemma. I want to work on my cadence, but I'm afraid of high cadence drills because I might develop too much fast twitch muscle fiber. This is very similar to an online query from Messia. It's on the Velo News website. Messia from Romania says, when doing low cadence, high force work, which muscle fibers work most? Is it slow twitch? Because they're low cadence, aren't they? Or is it fast twitch? Because aren't they high force? You know, what's going on there, guys? So today, guys, I want to talk about muscle fiber science as applied to cyclists and cycling. You know, it's a fascinating topic, really. And I can break this down into, I think, five myths in this area. So five myths, okay, here we go. Myth number one is that there are only two muscle fiber types. You know, we all talk about it, fast twitch and slow twitch, but it turns out there's not just fast twitch and slow twitch. The reason we talk about fast twitch and slow twitch is just because they were the ones that were labeled in the, what, 17th century, 1600s, when people looked at the muscle fiber, you know, like pathologically, post-mortem specimens, visually, what was going on visually, you know, and then later, in about the 19th century, they applied a simple histochemistry stain. And yeah, we got these darker kind of red muscle fiber stain, which seemed to be different to the ones that stained slightly lighter. And the darker ones, yes, they were the ones that were actually turned out to be full of mitochondria. You know, they were the ones that seemed to have the higher capillary density. And they were the ones that were full of myoglobin, the substance that enhances oxygen supply. And basically the myoglobin gave those filaments a reddish or darkish pigment. And we end up calling those muscle fibers slow twitch. But it turns out that there aren't just two types, slow twitch, and fast twitch in some kind of, you know, massive dichotomy. In fact, you know, slow twitch aren't really slow twitch at all. And relating slow twitch to cadence probably isn't that sensible, seeing as their time to peak contraction is around, what, 100 milliseconds, as opposed to typically, you know, maybe 50 milliseconds for type 2 or fast twitch fiber. Yes, the force they produce is somewhat different and their fatigue resistance is somewhat different. But we've got to look at these fibers under kind of a whole new rubric, a whole new understanding, not the old visual analysis that we used to do, not even the histochemistry method, but something new like, yes, electrophoresis from the 80s, where we're classifying the muscle fiber, not based on the old ATPAs, but actually on the myosin heavy chain isoform, you know, the kind of fiber level. And this is the thing, we're breaking this down to more, more than microscopic, so that we can say now with some confidence that muscle fibers don't just come in two types. We don't just have the pure type 1 and pure type 2. In fact, we don't even have pure type 1 and then type 2A, and then some people say A and B or A and X. It turns out that type 2X or the ultimate super fast twitch fiber are actually super rare. So what we are talking about and the lesson for today is that most muscle fibers actually come in hybrid forms. I think, by the way, there's more hybrid forms yet to discover. But if you look at this figure, we'll see that type 1 are actually mixed with type 2A to form a 1-2A hybrid. And type 2A are mixed with type 2B or type 2X to form type 2A, type 2X hybrid. And you can even get a 1, 2A, X hybrid. Okay, that's rare. But I'm just saying it exists. These hybrids are important. So I'll say that myth number one is that there's only two muscle fiber types. But I'll also say myth number two is that these pure types that you think you know about, i.e. 1, 2A and 2X, are also some kind of pure entity. That's not correct either. And those pure fibers actually turn out to be really rare. Now, moving on from this, we can actually learn a lesson and say that there's another myth that these hybrid fibers are not really important and that they're, you know, something to be ignored. That's a mistake, guys. 
In fact, these hybrid fibers are actually critical, and I'll tell you why. The reason is because the hybrid fibers are the ones that are in most in transition. They're the ones that, with training, become like the other pure types. So we may classify the pure types under like a classic table like this for their, you know, certain properties like energy and metabolism properties. And that's, yeah, useful. But it turns out that when you're training, you tend to convert the mixed types into what looks more like a pure type. Probably they stay in terms of their SDS page, electrophoresis profile, still as mixed fibers. You know, their change is more in terms of their properties rather than their actual classification, at least initially. But if you were to classify them, what would it look like for a typical cyclist? Well, here's the interesting thing. Because training changes your muscle fiber type, then the profile that you get of muscle fibers, even a more sophisticated profile like this, where we include the hybrids, depends on where you are in your cycling career. So if you're a beginner versus intermediate versus elite, or whether you also, you know, functionally you're a sprinter versus climber, let's say. So you'll notice a beginner who's just beginning to exercise, they have a lot of hybrid fibers. But the elite performer has trained a lot of those hybrids to be, you know, more specific in terms of type 1 or type 2 properties. So yes, if you're an elite sprinter, you probably have a lot of pure type 2A fibers, maybe up to 70-75%. And if you're a uh, climber, let's say, you probably have a lot of pure type 1 fibers. And that comes about through years of training, something we'll come back to in a second. So what I'm saying there is that if you train, you change the properties as shown here of the intermediate fibers to overlap the properties of what would have been a pure fiber in the beginning. But don't think that that only occurs in a certain type of fiber, like you can only go in one direction. It can go in both directions and in all fiber types. So there's some malleability, there's some adaptability across the spectrum. However, it is fair to say those in a middle zone, like 2A, are more likely to change than those that are more extreme. But that old chestnut that like type 1 fibers can't convert to type 2 doesn't apply. That's been shown to not be correct. Or type 2X is totally inflexible and cannot transition the other way. That's not the case either. Just look at somebody who's detrained or detraining. I've seen some very interesting data on deconditioning and we're going to present a calculator on deconditioning later in the year. But for now, check out this graph of what happens to your mitochondrial content when you stop training. Uh, the headline is that you lose your mitochondrial density. Remember, those are the powerhouses of the cell. The thing that gives your cells, muscle fibers and other cells of the body, it's fuel if you like. In this graph, there was a 50% reduction in mitochondrial content after only one week of detraining. Uh, you can get it back, of course, and the jury's out on how long it took. But in this study, it took four weeks to get back what it took one week to lose, which is shocking, of course. So I guess then if myth three is that intermediate or hybrid fibers are not useful Myth four would be that you're automatically a slow twitch fiber user or train, training your slow twitch fibers at low cadence. This is a mistake because we're talking about a completely different resolution of fiber twitch to what you're talking about with your muscle activation in terms of your cadence, you know. First of all, it's very complicated to break down muscle activation, even through one pedal cycle. But what we can say is the activation of muscle fiber type is more closely related to force, that would be torque, than cadence. A low force, probably low cadence, but it could be intermediate or high cadence situations where um, the demands on your muscles low, then you'll be activating mostly slow twitch. But as the demands get higher, you recruit more and more muscle fibers. Within one muscle, you're, you're recruiting more muscle fibers. That is a classic recruitment principle in science called the Henneman principle, Henneman size principle. Uh, it's shown in this figure here, actually, guys, but also in this chart. So this has an implication for training as well, because the more um, trained and the more 
fit you are, whether you're a runner or a cyclist, then the more your threshold is higher for recruiting the next layer of fibers. So let's say when would peak recruitment of muscle fiber occur as a percentage of VO2 max? Well, if you're a beginner, it might be a 50, 60% to start to recruit peak recruitment, sorry, of type one. Whereas like if you've got a super high fitness, that could be 75, 80%. And type two recruitment for the beginner might begin around 75%. So whereas the ultra high endurance athlete is recruiting, you know, peak fiber type one at 75 VO2 max, the beginners recruiting type two of that and type two X for the beginner probably becomes, you know, around 100% of their VO2 max effort. They're recruiting their type two X, but type two X for the elite might be 133%. So they've got the capacity, they've got like, an overhead where they can still work with that. And the lesson for training there, I guess, is that you can train at different intensities and get different results. So training at one intensity, even like VO2 max intervals or FTP training or sweet spot training, although it's tempting to focus all your training there, is probably a mistake. Okay, now we come on to the big one, the big myth, if you like. Myth number five is that we can't change the fiber properties. You know, I've heard this said quite a lot. Well, you know, how could that be? Because if you look at a chart of a beginner versus elite athlete or a 100 meter runner versus a 5K runner or, or a sprinter versus a climber, we can see that their muscle fiber properties are really quite different. So are you telling me then that these muscle fiber properties have all been genetically inherited? That would be a massive inflexibility in terms of adaptation. You know, the human body is not usually built that way, if you see what I mean. You know, we've got to be able to respond to stimuli, we've got to be able to adapt to change. That is what physiology is all about. Now, what we do know for sure is that the training stimulus alters the functional property of the fibers. We've already said that. So let's say their mitochondrial content or their capillary density, you know, or their response to fuel usage, they will all change, you know, with the type of stimulus that you're putting into the muscle. I assume you accept that. Yeah, that, that's key. But what I'm also talking about is something even more fundamental. Can we manipulate the actual fiber type? Now, we should kind of know this answer since the 70s because there were these, what sounds quite gruesome to me, uh, studies where they cut the nerve of certain fiber types. So the innovation unit, if you like, was cut and the nerve was reattached. So like, let's say the slow twitch nerve was attached to a fast twitch muscle fiber unit. And what happened was, yes, the muscle fiber changed their properties as a result of that changing stimulus of the nerve. But does that happen in real life? Well, yes, it does. Now, I'm not the world's expert on muscle fiber. I'm not claiming to be. I'm giving you a heads up here on things that you might not know. But if you want to check out on YouTube, Andy Galpin's team have looked at this in great detail. In fact, he's recently published a fascinating paper of identical monozygotic twins who had vastly different training habits. You know, one was, let's say, a couch potato. All right, that's a slight, slightly unfair. He was a trucker driver. And the other was uh, in training for marathons for 30 years or so, 30, 35 years. They found that the endurance trained twin had 90% slow twitch muscle fibers, 10% fast twitch, whereas the untrained twin had 50% slow twitch, 30% fast twitch, and 20% ultra fast twitch. And other studies, many other studies have shown that an endurance stimulus like marathon running or long distance cycling is a stimulus to change muscle fiber proportions. And actually it can happen with all types of muscle fibers, not just type 2A, yes, that's more common, or type 2X, but also type 1 also can be converted. So what does all this mean for cyclists? Well, essentially it means that there's an approximate relationship between fiber type and cadence. There's a closer relationship between fiber type and torque, which is why hopefully next month's video, I'm going to do a core cycling topic 
I'm almost scared to take it on because there's so much opinion about this, which is the science of cadence. Because the science of cadence is actually a lot about the science of talk because you manage your cadence in order to deliver a manageable talk to your muscles. But as a teaser for next month, I will say this, that when you're trying to find the optimum cadence, I'm going to call that the cadence sweet spot. There is a tension between metabolic efficiency, how little wasted energy you have, and actually the power, the optimum band um, for power, which is obviously a combination of frequency, RPM, cadence times torque. And a little aside here is the reason we're talking about efficiency is that you probably can visualize the function of a tendon as being like a spring. You know, when it gets stretched, it recoils and returns a huge percentage of its energy back to baseline. It's an incredibly efficient mechanism, very akin to like a spring, basically. However, a muscle behaves the same way, but not as efficiently. So the result is when it contracts and then expands again, it loses a little bit of energy. Okay, it's a tiny percentage as a result of one muscle contraction and relaxation, but multiply that thousands of times through thousands of RPMs and you actually get a problem, which is that it costs energy for your muscle to exercise. And that wasted energy can actually be added up mathematically. I'll show you next month how to do that. And I can build you a simple calculator that will hopefully work out optimum cadence from these principles I'm talking about today, i.e. muscle fiber types and what we've learned. Okay, guys, that was the science of muscle fiber types as applied to cycling and endurance athletes. It's equally applicable to triathletes as well. I hope that was useful for you. If you knew all this already, then tell me something I didn't know in the comments below. If you can give us a like or share, that's great, guys. And as always, have a great ride out there. Stay safe. See you in the next video. And if, and if you can give us a follow either on Facebook, our Strava Club, or even Patreon, it would be appreciated. Take care, guys. Till next time. Hey, guys, while the titles are rolling, I want to give a few words of thanks. I want to do a shout out to this excellent paper. You know, the one where I showed the images of the 40 year old triathlete, the 74 year old sedentary man, and then the 70 year old triathlete. You can download that. I'm going to put a link to it in the comment section below. I also want to give a shout out to this excellent website, Swim Smart. If you want to quickly get a primer on muscle physiology, muscle training, this is probably the place to go. Also, don't forget, guys, we've just had our draw for the Wend Wax prize. We've expanded the prize pool because basically so many of you entered. We had nearly 100 entries. So we've got 10 winners now. I'll just say the shout out to winner one and two are Bjorn Miller and Marie Shepard. And as a thank you for everyone who entered and also as a combo Black Friday and Cyber Monday, if anybody wants any of our Training Peaks plans, that's the 30th of November to the 2nd of December. Just email me which plan you want. I'm going to give you a code for 50% off for the next three days only, guys. All right. Happy training, guys.